Five, Part One of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joseph Early, Falls Church, Virginia. The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro, translated by John Dryden. Book Five, Games and a Conflagration, Part One. Meantime, the Trojan cuts his watery way, fixed on his voyage through the curling sea. Then, casting back his eyes with dire amaze, sees on the Punic shore the mounting blaze. The cause unknown, yet his presaging mind, The fate of Dido from the fire divined. He knew the stormy souls of womankind, What secret springs their eager passions move, How capable of death for injured love. Dire auguries from thence the Trojans draw, till neither fires nor shining shores they saw. Now seas and skies their prospect only bound, an empty space above, a floating field around. But soon the heavens with shadows were o'erspread, a swelling cloud hung hovering o'er their head. Livid it looked, the threatening of a storm, then night and horror, ocean's face deformed. The pilot, Palinurus, cried aloud, What gusts of weather from that gathering cloud my thoughts presage! Ere yet the tempest roars, stand to your tackle, mates, and stretch your oars. Contract your swelling sails and luff to wind. The frighted crew performed the task assigned, then to his fearless chief. Not heaven, said he, though Jove himself should promise Italy, can stem the torrent of this raging sea. Mark how the shifting winds from west arise, and what collected night involves the skies. Nor can our shaken vessels live at sea, much less against the tempest force their way. Tis fate diverts our course, and fate we must obey. Not far from hence, if I observed aright, the southing of the stars and polar light, Cecilia lies, whose hospitable shores in safety we may reach with struggling oars. Aeneas then replied, too sure, I find, we strive in vain against the seas and wind. Now, shift your sails. What place can please me more than what you promise, the Sicilian shore, whose hallowed earth Anchises' bone contains, and where a prince of Trojan lineage reigns? The course resolved, before the western wind, they scud amain and make the port a sign. Meanwhile, Acestes from a lofty stand beheld the fleet descending on the land, and, not unmindful of his ancient race, down from the cliff he ran with eager pace, and held the hero in a strict embrace. Of a rough Libyan bear the spoils he wore, and either hand a pointed javelin bore. His mother was a dame of Darden blood, his sire Crinesius, a Sicilian flood. He welcomes his returning friends ashore with plenteous country cates and homely store. Now, when the following morn had chased away the flying stars and light restored the day, Aeneas called the Trojan troops around and thus bespoke them from a rising ground. Offspring of heaven, divine Dardanian race, The sun revolving through the ethereal space, The shining circle of the year has filled, Since first this isle my father's ashes held. 
and now the rising day renews the year a day forever sad forever dear this would i celebrate with annual games with gifts on altars piled and holy flames though banished to gaetulia's barren sands caught on the grecian seas or hostile lands but since this happy storm our fleet has driven not as i deem without the will of heaven upon these friendly shores and flowery plains which hide anchises and his blessed remains let us with joy perform his honors due and pray for prosperous winds our voyage to renew pray that in towns and temples of our own the name of great anchises may be known and yearly games may spread the gods renown our sports acestes of the trojan race with royal gifts ordained is pleased to grace two steers on every ship the king bestows his gods and ours shall share your equal vows besides if nine days hence the rosy morn shall with unclouded light the skies adorn that day with solemn sports i mean to grace light galleys on the seas shall run a watery race some shall in swiftness for the gold contend and others try the twanging bow to bend the strong with iron gauntlets armed shall stand opposed in combat on the yellow sand let all be present at their games prepared and joyful victors wait the just reward but now assist the rites with garlands crowned he said and first his brows with myrtle bound then helymus by his example led and old acestes each adorned his head thus young ascanius with a sprightly grace his temples tied and all the trojan race aeneas then advanced amidst the train by thousands followed through the fruitful plain to great anchises tomb which when he found he poured to bacchus on the hollowed ground two bowls of sparkling wine of milk to more and two from offered bulls of purple gore with roses then the sepulchre he strode and thus his father's ghost he spoke aloud hail o ye holy manas hail again paternal ashes now reviewed in vain the gods permitted not that you with me should reach the promised shores of italy or tiber's flood what flood soe'er it be scarce had he finished when with speckled pride a serpent from the tomb began to glide his huge bulk on seven high volumes rolled blue was his breath of back but streaked with gold thus riding on his curls he seemed to pass a rolling fire along and singe the grass more various colors through his body run than iris with her bow imbibes the sun betwixt the rising altars and around the sacred monster shot along the ground with harmless play amidst the bowls he passed and with his lolling tongue essayed the taste thus fed with holy food the wondrous guest within the hollow tomb retired to rest the pious prince surprised at what he viewed the funeral honors with more zeal renewed doubtful if this the place's genius were or guardian of his father's sepulchre two sheep according to the rites he slew as many swine and steers of sable hue new generous wine he from the goblets poured and called his father's ghost from hell restored the glad attendants in long order come offering their gifts at great anchises tomb some add more oxen some divide the spoil some place the chargers on the grassy soil some blow the fire and offer entrails broil now came the day desired the skies were bright with rosy lustre of the rising light 
the bordering people, roused by sounding fame of Trojan feasts and great Acestes' name, the crowded shore with acclamations fill, part to behold and part to prove their skill. And first the gifts in public view they place, green laurel wreaths and palm, the victor's grace. Within the circle arms and tripods lie, ingots of gold and silver heaped on high, and vests embroidered of the Tyrian dye. The trumpet's clangor then the feast proclaims, and all prepare for their appointed games. Four galleys first, with equal rowers bear, advancing in the watery lists appear. The speedy dolphin that outstrips the wind bore Menestheus, author of the Memean kind. Gaius the vast Chimera's bulk commands, which rising like a towering city stands three trojans tug at every laboring oar three banks in three degrees the sailors bore beneath their sturdy strokes the billows roar sir gestus who began the sergian race in the great centaur took the leading place cloanthus on the sea-green scylla stood from whom cluentheus draws his trojan blood Far in the sea, against the foaming shore, there stands a rock. The raging billows roar above his head in storms. But when tis clear, uncurl their ridgy backs, and at his foot appear. In peace below the gentle waters run, the comorants above lie basking in the sun. On this the hero fixed an oak in sight, the mark to guide the mariners aright. To bear with this the seamen stretch their oars, then round the rock they steer and seek the former shores. The lots decide their place. Above the rest, each leader shining in his Tyrian vest, the common crew with wreaths of poplar brows, their temples crown and shade their sweaty brows be smeared with oil their naked shoulders shine all take their seats and wait the sounding sign they grip their oars and every panting breast is raised by turns by hope by turns with fear depressed the clangor of the trumpet gives the sign at once they start advancing in a line with shouts the sailors rend the starry skies lashed with their oars the smoky billows rise sparkles the briny main and the vexed ocean fries exact in time with equal strokes they row at once the brushing oars and brazen prow dash up the sandy waves and ope the depths below not fiery coursers in a chariot race invade the field with half so swift a pace nor the fierce driver with more fury lends the sounding lash and ere the stroke descends low to the wheels his pliant body bends the partial crowd their hopes and fears divide and aid with eager shouts the favored side cries murmurs clamors with a mixing sound from woods to woods from hills to hills rebound amidst the loud applauses of the shore gaius outstripped the rest and sprung before cloanthus better manned pursued him fast but his o'ermasted galley checked his haste the centaur and the dolphin brushed the brine with equal oars advancing in a line and now the mighty centaur seems to lead and now the speedy dolphin gets ahead now board to board the rival vessels row the billows lave the skies and ocean groans below they reach the mark proud gaius and his train in triumph rode the victors of the main but steering round he charged his pilot stand more close to shore and skim along the sand let others bear to sea. Menotes heard, 
but secret shelves too cautiously he feared and fearing sought the deep and still aloof he steered with louder cries the captain called again bear to the rocky shore and shun the main he spoke and speaking at his stern he saw the bold cloanthus near the shelvings draw betwixt the mark and him the scylla stood and in a closer compass ploughed the flood he passed the mark and wheeling got before gaius blasphemed the gods devoutly swore cried out for anger and his hair he tore mindless of others lives so high was grown his rising rage and careless of his own the trembling dotard to the deck he drew then hoisted up and overboard he threw this done he seized the helm his fellows cheered turned short upon the shelves and madly steered hardly his head the plunging pilot rears clogged with his clothes and cumbered with his years now dripping wet he climbs the cliff with pain the crowd that saw him fall and float again shout from the distant shore and loudly laugh to see his heaving breast disgorge the briny draught the following centaur and the dolphin's crew their vanished hopes of victory renew while Gaius lags, they kindle in the race. To reach the mark, Sir Gestus takes the place. Menestus pursues, and while around they wind, comes up, not half his galley's length behind. Then on the deck amidst his mates appeared, and thus their drooping courage he cheered. My friends, and Hector's followers heretofore, exert your vigor, and tug the laboring oar stretch to your strokes my still unconquered crew whom from the flaming walls of troy i drew in this our common interest let me find that strength of hand that courage of the mind as when you stem the strong malayan flood and o'er the syrites broken billows rolled i seek not now the foremost palm to gain though yet but ah that haughty wish is vain let those enjoy it whom the gods ordain but to be last the lags of all the race redeem yourselves and me from that disgrace now one and all they lug amain they row at the full stretch and shake the brazen prow the sea beneath them sinks their laboring sides are swelled and sweat runs guttering down in tide chance aids their daring with unhoped success sir Gestus, eager with his beak to press betwixt the rival galley and the rock shuts up the unwieldy centaur in the lock the vessel struck and with the dreadful shock her oars she shivered and her head she broke the trembling rowers from their banks arise and anxious for themselves renounce the prize with iron poles they heave her off the shores and gather from the sea their floating oars the crew of menestus with elated minds urge their success and call the willing wines then ply their oars and cut their liquid way in larger compass on the roomy sea as when the dove her rocky hole forsakes roused in a fright her sounding rings she sakes the cavern rings with clattering out she flies and leaves her callow care and cleaves the skies at first she flutters but at length she springs to smoother flight and shoots upon her wings so menestheus in the dolphin cuts the sea and flying with a force that force assists his way sir Gestus in the centaur soon he passed wedged in the rocky shoals and sticking fast in vain the victor he with cries implores and practices to row with shattered oars then menestus bears with gaius and outflies the ship without a pilot yields the pry unvanquished scylla now alone remains her he pursues and all his vigor strain shouts from the favoring multitude arise 
applauding echo to the shouts replies shouts wishes and applause run rattling through the skies these clamors with disdain the scylla heard much grudged the praise but more the robbed reward resolved to hold their own they mend their pace all obstinate to die or gain the race raised with success the dolphin swiftly ran for they can conquer who believe they can both urge their oars and fortune both supplies and both perhaps had shared an equal prize when to the seas cloanthus holds his hands and succor from the watery powers demand gods of the liquid realms on which i row if given by you the laurel bind my brow assist to make me guilty of my vow a snow-white bull shall on your shore be slain his offered entrails cast into the main and ruddy wine from golden goblets thrown your grateful gift and my return shall own the choir of nymphs and phorcus from below with virgin panopia heard this vow and old portunus with his breath of hand pushed on and sped the galley to the land swift as a shaft o oh, winged wing she flies and darting to the port obtains the prize the herald summons all and then proclaims cloanthus conqueror of the naval games the prince with laurel crowns the victor's head and three fat steers are to his vessel led the ship's reward with generous wine beside and sums of silver which the crew divide the leaders are distinguished from the rest the victor honored with a nobler vest where gold and purple strive in equal rows and needlework its happy cost bestows there ganymede is wrought with living art chasing through ida's groves the trembling heart breathless he seems yet eager to pursue when from aloft descends in open view the bird of jove and sousing on his prey with crooked talons bears the boy away in vain with lifted hands and gazing eyes his gods behold him soaring through the sky and dogs pursue his flight with imitated cry menesthus the second victor was declared and summoned there the second prize he shared a coat of mail which brave demoleus bore more brave aeneas from his shoulders tore in single combat on the trojan shore this was ordained for menesthus to possess in war for his defence for ornament in peace rich was the gift and glorious to behold but yet so ponderous with its plates of gold that scarce two servants could the weight sustain yet loaded thus demoleus o'er the plain pursued and lightly seized the trojan train the third succeeding to the last reward two goodly bowls of massy silver shared with figures prominent and richly wrought and two brass cauldrons from dodona brought thus all rewarded by the hero's hands their conquering temples bound with purple bands and now sir Justus, clearing from the rock brought back his galley shattered with the shock forlorn she looked without an aiding oar and hooted by the vulgar made to shore as when a snake surprised upon the road is crushed athwart her body by the load of heavy wheels or with a mortal wound her belly bruised and trodden to the ground in vain with loosened curls she crawls along yet fierce above she brandishes her tongue glares with her eyes and bristles with her scales but groveling in the dust her parts unsound she trails so slowly to the port the centaur tends but what she wants in oars with sails amends yet for his galley saved the grateful prince is pleased the unhappy chief to recompense flow low 
the Cretan slave rewards his care, beauteous herself, with lovely twins as fair. From thence his way the Trojan hero bent into the neighboring plain with mountains pent, whose sides were shaded with surrounding wood. Full in the midst of this fair valley stood a native theater, which rising slow by just degrees o'erlooked the ground below. I on a sylvan throne the leader sate, a numerous train attend in solemn state. Here those that in the rapid course delight, desire of honor and the prize invite. The rival runners without order stand, the Trojans mixed with the Sicilian band. First Nisus with Euralus appears, Euralus a boy of blooming years. With sprightly grace and equal beauty crowned, Nisus for friendship to the youth renowned, Diora's next of Priam's royal race, then Salius joined with Patron took their place. But Patron in Arcadia had his birth, and Salius his from Arcananian earth. When two Sicilian youths, the names of those, swift Helimus and lovely Panopes, both jolly huntsmen, both in forest bred, and owning all Acestes for the head, and several others of ignobler name, whom time has not delivered o'er to fame. To these the hero thus his thoughts explained, in words with general approbation gained. When common largesse is for all designed, the vanquished and the victor shall be joined. Two darts of polished steel and Gnosian wood, a silver-studded axe alike bestowed. The foremost three have olive wreaths decreed. The first of these obtains a stately steed, adorned with trappings, and the next in fame the quiver of an Amazonian dame, with feathered Thracian arrows well supplied. A golden belt shall gird his manly side, which with a sparkling diamond shall be tied. The third this Grecian helmet shall content, he said. To their appointed base they went, with beating hearts the expected sign received, and starting all at once the barrier leave. Spread out as on the winged winds they flew, and seized the distant goal with greedy view. Shot from the crowd, swift Nisus, all or past, nor storms nor thunder equal half his haste. The next, but though the next yet far disjoined, came Salius and Euralius behind. Then Helimus, who young Diorus plied, step after step, and almost side by side, his shoulders pressing, and in longer space had won, or left at least a dubious race. Now spent, the gold they almost reach at last, when eager Nisus, hapless in his haste, slipped first, and slipping fell upon the plain, soaked with the blood of oxen newly slain. The careless victor had not marked his way, but treading where the treacherous puddle lay, his heels flew up, and on the grassy floor he fell, besmeared with filth and holy gold. Not mindless then, Euralius of thee, nor of the sacred bonds of amity, he strove the immediate rival's hope to cross, and caught the foot of Salius as he rose. So Salius lay extended on the plain. Euralius springs out the prize to gain, and leaves the crowd. Applauding peals attend the victor to his goal who vanquished by his friend. Next Helimus, then Diorus came, by two misfortunes made the third in fame. But Salius enters, and exclaiming loud for justice, deafens and disturbs the crowd, urges his cause may in the court be heard, and pleads the prize is wrongfully conferred. But favor for Euralius appears, his blooming beauty with his tender years had bribed the judges for the promised prize. 
Besides, Dioras fills the court with cries, who vainly reaches at the last reward, if the first palm on Salius be conferred. Then thus the prince, let no disputes arise, where fortune placed it, I award the prize. But fortune's errors give me leave to mend, at least to pity my deserving friend, he said. And from among the spoils he draws, ponderous with shaggy mane and golden paws, a lion's hide. To Salius this he gives. Nisus with envy sees the gift and grieves. If such rewards to vanquished men are due, he said, and falling is to rise by you, what prize may Nisus from your bounty claim, who merited first rewards and fame? In falling, both an equal fortune tried, would fortune for my fall so well provide. With this he pointed to his face, and showed his hand, and all his habit smeared with blood. The indulgent father of the people smiled, and caused to be produced an ample shield of wondrous art. But did he may unwrought, long since from Neptune's bars in triumph brought. This Given to Nisus, he divides the rest, and equal justice in his gifts expressed. The race thus ended, and rewards bestowed, once more the prince bespeaks the attentive crowd. If there be here, whose dauntless courage dare, in gauntlet fight with limbs and body bare, his opposite sustain an open view, stand forth the champion, and the games renew. Two prizes I propose, and thus divide. A bull with gilded horns and fillets tied shall be the portion of the conquering chief. A sword and helm shall cheer the loser's grief. Then haughty Dares in the lists appears. Stalking his strides, his head erected bears. His nervous arms the weighty gauntlet wield, and loud applauses echo through the field. Dares alone in combat used to stand the match of mighty Paris hand to hand. The same at Hector's funerals undertook gigantic Butes of the Amitian stock, and by the stroke of his resistless hand stretched the vast bulk upon the yellow sand. Such Dares was, and such he strode along, and drew the wonder of the gazing throng. His brawny back and ample breast he shows, His lifted arms around his head he throws, And deals in whistling air his empty blows. His match is sought, but through the trembling band Not one dares answer to the proud demand. Presuming of his force with sparkling eyes, Already he devours the promised prize. He claims the bull with all less insolence, and having seized his horns, accosts the prince. If none my matchless valor dares oppose, how long shall Darius wait his dastard foes? Permit me, chief, permit without delay to lead this uncontested gift away. The crowd assents, and with redoubled cries, for the proud challenger demands the prize. End of Book 5, Part 1